Hey everybody, and welcome to my second of two videos about this camera, the Nikon FA. The first video, we just looked at the general layout and talked a little bit about the camera. In this video, we're going to look in depth at how to use it. First thing we're going to look at is lens mounting and unmounting. So, I'm going to unmount the lens first off so that I can show you how to mount it. Here's your lens mount, and here is the lens's lens mount. There's a white dot right there and that lines up with your aperture indicator. So just set it right in there. And then rotate counter or anti-clockwise until you hear the click and your lens is mounted. Now this is not an autofocus lens, or I'm sorry, this is not an autofocus camera, so all of your focusing is done manually. To unmount the lens, you simply push this button down and hold it until you get about that far and then you can release it. You're just gonna turn clockwise until it stops and then you can pull the lens out of the mount. It's that simple. Next thing we're gonna look at is how to load and unload film. First thing we need to do is open up the camera back. And we do that by rotating this little dial right here up on the top counterclockwise so we can pull up the film release knob. I'm gonna open the camera back. There we go. You don't need to set a, a spool underneath it. I do because I'm not going to be holding the camera. We're going to grab our film and it just gets set right into the film cassette chamber that way. And then we put the knob back in place. I'm going to pull out a bit of a leader. Hit the shutter. Remember keeping your fingers away from the shutter as you depress it. I'm going to feed the leader into here. I'm going to, I'm going to feed the leader. It's going in. It's going in. This is not ending up on the outtakes roll for this camera. Oh, there we go. First time, perfect. Never happens. So we'll take an, up a second image, just or a second frame, just to help make sure that this all stays on nicely. Now in real life, what you're going to do is you're going to close this and you're going to take three frames. To get your camera up to the first frame. Now from this point until you finished your film and rewound it completely, the film ha back has to stay closed. Film is one and done. Once it's exposed to the light it will either have an image or it will be unusable. So if you open your film back right now, if you've taken 36 images on it, you open up your film back, you're going to erase all of those images. So I'm going to show you how this functions by using this, this sacrificial film in here so you can understand what's going on inside of your camera when you take a picture. So after you hit the shutter button, the shutter activates right here. The next thing you do is advance the film. And what happens is that the film is taken up on this sprocket that pulls it forward this way. Now you can see if you saw the first video, I said the outer two film rails help keep, thing, help keep the film aligned. You can see that it's not going to go up and down. This pin helps to keep the film feeding properly. This sprocket keeps the film from pulling backwards into the back of the camera and giving you a double exposure. And then there's these two silver guide rails underneath the sprocket holes that line up with the film pressure plate to keep this flat so that the lens focuses the light properly on the film. Everything inside of the camera is designed to keep the film flat so that your images turn out well. Now, you're going to go through and you're going to take up all 36 or 24 of your images. And you're going to get to a point where you advance it part way and it won't advance. It's going to let you, that, let you know that the film is done. So to rewind your film, now again, remember, until you have completely rewound your film, your film back needs to be closed if you don't want to have your film ruined. To rewind your film, you push this button in on the bottom right here. I'm going to flip this lever out and it'll, it'll start taking off. There we go. And I'm keeping my thumb here because I'm doing the job of these little cass cassette clips on the film back. And as you rewind it, it just goes right back into the film cassette. Now listen for this sound. You'll hear a little click 
and then the tension will suddenly change. And then when you completely rewind this, which I'm not going to because I need to do this, use this for another video today, then the tension will really change and it'll become very easy to, to, to rewind. You don't want to keep rewinding over and over and over again. That's a good way to scratch your film and images. But once you hear that little click, then it has come off of the film take up spool and you're almost done rewinding it. Then to, you would just open up the film back, pull the cassette out, and put that in your pocket or wherever you would need to put it until you go to get it developed. And remember to rewind it completely so that you don't accidentally run it through the camera a second time. So the next thing we're going to do is change the batteries. This camera uses two A76 batteries. You can also use LR44. LR44s have a disadvantage that they can lose charge over time and have inconsistent voltage over their life. They also have a tendency to leak more readily than A76 batteries do. So I really recommend A76s. For this, you can just use a quarter or um, fun fact, every country in the world has a coin that will work in these slots except North Korea. So North Koreans, I'm sorry, you are SOL when it comes to this. We just want to use a quarter and unscrew the film cassette chamber. Looks like we got it. There we go. Almost. Almost, really? Okay, there we go. And so what you'd want to do is take out your two dead batteries. They're actually fine, so they're going right back in. And if you touch them with your fingers, you want to kind of clean them on your pants leg if they're, if they're fresh, because you don't want your finger oils to be on the contacts, as that's a really good way to shorten the lifespan of your batteries. Here is the film cassette thing, and you can see that it tells you how to put the batteries in. You can either use Back when these were made, there was a single battery that was the size of two of these, and for three volts. I don't think those are made anymore. Uh, so you can also just use two 1.5 volt batteries. Now this is showing you that the negative contact is down towards the cap right here. The negative contact will be the one that doesn't have any writing on it. So I'm going to hold the cap like this, and the first battery goes in negative contact down, the second battery goes in negative contact down. I'm going to put it into the camera's body. Now to screw it in, this should be very simple. There should be no effort in this whatsoever. If you have to force it or it's putting up resistance, that means you've cross-threaded it and you want to back it out and start over again. So I, did, I didn't cross-thread that, but if I had, I would keep backing it out until I feel the threads overlap. And what'll happen is you'll be rotating it slowly and then you'll feel a little, uh, a little, uh, it'll, the, the threads, as the two threads move like this, will, will jolt back down a little bit. And that lets you know that you're ready to start threading it correctly. So there we go. And that is changing the battery. Now one thing to bear, in, so to check the battery, now that you've put new batteries and you want to make sure that they're going to work, the way that you do that is to simply look through the viewfinder and flip the, um, flip the film advance lever out and have to press your shutter. If the LCD light, uh, indicator lights up and has any data in it, that means that your battery is good and you're set to go. One thing about the Nikon FA is that it drains battery 24-7. Because it has a quartz cell in it, the quartz cell is constantly draining battery as it vibrates just a little bit. So if you're not going to use your camera for more than a couple of days, it's a good idea to take the batteries out. And never let the batteries sit in the camera when you're storing it or not using it because since it's constantly draining battery juice, at some point the batteries are more prone to leaking than they would be if the camera wasn't draining battery power. So a lot of people like to know how to do flash photography with their cameras. So this camera has two ways to do flash photography. You can either put a flash on the hot shoe or you can plug it into the 
port up front. Now this uses, for the time, Nikon's most cutting edge flashes and most, if not all, Nikon, in fact, I'm certain that all Nikon flashes today will still work on this camera. As will third-party off-brand lenses, either from the 60s, 70s, 80s, or even today. I know there's a huge gap between the 80s and today, but forgive me. So because this has the center pin, it, it can use just the basic dumb all mechanical flashes or all, you know, single power flashes, not all mechanical. They're not, they're all electronic. Never mind, I'm lost in the weeds at this point. Then you can also plug flashes into the PC port up here if you want to do something like have it off camera, way off to the side or something like that. Or if you want to plug an RF unit into this and have an RF unit on your flash, then you don't need to have a cable for it anymore. Uh, in general, the absolute worst place to have a flash that you're using is on top of the camera pointing at your subject. That's a really good way to make your subject look like a wax figure. The flash hot shoe on top is really good if you want to have a control flash up here and then multiple or something like that, or if you're using a flash up top and you want to bounce it up at the ceiling and then back to your subject. But in general, uh, don't put a flash on here that you're just going to point right at your subject. So the flash sync for this is 1 250th of a second and slower. So how does that work? We can see here that it says 1 250th in red. That's your indication. The different colored shutter speed, that 1 250th is your flash sync. So here's why it's your fastest speed. If you remember from my first video, I gave the example of here's the shutter opening and then, and then here's the shutter closing behind it. So at 1 250th, 1 250th of a second, the first shutter opens, and then the entire film plane is exposed to light for a very brief time before the trailing curtain comes in, and then you reset. At 1 125th, it would be even longer, and then the trailing curtain comes in. Now at 1 500th, let's say, it might look something like this. So if you use the flash at 1 500th of a second, your top and bottom, or something like that, might might be all that's illuminated and where my hands are would be dark because the shutter curtain would be blocking the light from the flash getting to your film. At, and the way that the shutters work is that they don't physically move the blades any faster. It's just the gap between them gets narrower. So at one four thousandth of a second, it's going to have a very, very narrow gap going between them. So one two fiftieth of a second and slower, at some point in that exposure, the entire film plane is open to the light for a very brief time. And that's why you can use a flash at that fast of a shutter speed. All right, so here we are looking through the viewfinder on the Nikon FA. And that circle in the middle that you can see is your center weighted average circle. It's the one that has the Nikon cap uh, inside of it, so it's this one out here. This is your center range finger, right where the tip of my finger is pointed right now. So you can see there's a mic small micro prism collar and then the split ring in the middle. Going around, there is, there we go, up in the left. To the left of that LCD, there's a red light, which is not on right now because that's your flash ready indicator and it only works when you have a flash connected. Where it says C250, oh, come on. C250, that is your LCD screen. That's gonna tell you what aperture or shutter speed you're set at. So I'm gonna set this into manual mode really quickly. And you can see that as I change the shutter speed, now it says M on the left, which lets me know I'm in manual mode. And it says C250 until you've gotten to the first frame. So if it says that, it means you're, you're still advancing your, your images. Now you can see uh, it says 1 500th. I'm going to change the shutter speed to 1 2000th. I'm going to change it again to 1 30th. So that just lets me know what my shutter speed is. Now the M plus on the left lets me know that I'm overexposing the image. So you can see that number right there changing 2.8 to 4. That's my aperture preview window. That lets me see what the aperture setting is going to be. So at f8, now I'm underexposed, because you can tell it says M minus. Come on, M plus at f30, at 130th. So I'm not gonna change the shutter speed. Instead, oh come on. 
going to adjust the aperture. There we go, right in between. And you can set the aperture part way in between to get the pre most precise setting in manual mode. Now you can see there's a red plus minus light over on the right side. That lets me know that I am compensating my exposure slightly. So I'm going to change that back to zero. Now you can see that that's gone. So if that red light is on, you have exposure compensation set. So let's, let's talk a little bit about how this meter works. I said it was through the lens, off the film, five area matrix. So let's take, let's, let's analyze each part of that. So let's say for a minute, let's pretend that the back of the camera right here is your film. It's behind the shutter curtain right now. And that here's the, the lens and the light's gonna come in and hit the film. Let me show you something neat inside of this camera. You can see on the bottom that little reflective blue light. That's a light meter. And there's more light meters in the viewfinder as well. But that one on the bottom is vital for what we're going to talk about now. So when you take a, an exposure, your mirror flips up and then the light comes through your lens and then it's going to hit the film. So here's your lens, the light's going to come through it and hit the film. Your film does not absorb 100% of the light that comes into it. If it did, it would be a black hole, so some amount of it bounces off. Well, that meter measures the amount of light coming off of the film to help make an even more precise exposure during the exposure. So if you set your camera, let's say, let's say you're in program mode. We'll talk a little bit about how the different modes work in just a minute. But if you're in program mode and your, your camera thinks it's gonna take one 1 of a second at, at f5.6, you take the picture, the light coming through at f5.6 hits the film, some of it bounces off and the camera says, oh, oh shucks, I was wrong, it needs to be 1 100th 1 of a second or 1 200th, then it just makes that adjustment. The off the film metering also allows the uh, flash units that Nikon made to work very effectively with the camera to make sure that the flash images don't come out over or underexposed. One nice thing about this camera is that it has matrix or center weighted metering. Now, what that means is that, I talked a little bit about this in the first video, but let's say that this little lens cap right here, let's put this at the center, there we go. Let's say that this lens cap represents the center weighted ring of your FA's viewfinder, okay? This is one of your matrix metering areas. Here, 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 and here are the other four, and they're divided like a crosshairs with a circle around this ring. And I believe there's a little bit of overlap between these two right here, but I could be wrong. So in matrix metering, all five of these contribute equally to the exposure decision, but if this is really bright up here and this is really dark down here, then the camera has a way to calculate what that means for the proper exposure. That way, if you have the sun up in this corner, it's not going to cause the entire image to be dark like it would have with an old averaging meter. Now, if you just switch it to, to center weighted, this, this area in the center of your camera contributes 75% of the metering data and the rest of this is 25%. So let's say how to use that. Okay, so let's say you're going to take a picture of a person and you want to put their face right in the center. If you switch it to center weighted, then you know that that person's face is going to drive the exposure data. Likewise, if you have a very high contrast scene and you want to just focus on the light that's in a small portion of it, you can switch to center weighted, take the meter reading off that small portion of it, set your settings, recompose and take your picture. So the next thing we're gonna do is talk about how to use the shooting modes, program, shutter priority, aperture priority, and full manual. So we switch to them by moving this dial up to the mode that you want. I'm going to start with program and go downward. Program mode, for this mode you need to set the aperture to the smallest set, smallest opening, which is the largest number, 
And if you have a lock on it, you can use that too, but you don't have to. So that's the first thing. Set your aperture to 16 or 22, whatever the, the largest number is. You want to make sure that your dial is set to P. Now, the camera will automatically select the shutter speed and aperture. So it doesn't matter what your dial is set to. You can set it to anything. The camera is automatically going to determine what setting to use. So if I make the, the cover, if I cover this and make it really dark, you can see that the shutter speed was a little bit slower in the second, but not much. But the aperture would have been significantly larger. You also want to make sure for this that the camera is in matrix metering mode. And the way you switch between the modes is with this dial right down here. So if you push it in and rotate it up so you can see a red dot on top, it's in center weighted mode. If you rotate it backwards, now it's in uh, matrix metering. So make sure that you cannot see a red dot in order for program mode to work. If you look through the viewfinder and the LCD on the left says FEE, -E, what that means is that your aperture ring is not set to the smallest setting. So if you see FEE, -E, just adjust your aperture ring to put it at the smallest setting. Now, when you actually take a picture in program mode, all you have to do is push the button, well focus, and then push the button. The camera does everything else for you. The next mode that we're, we're going to look at is S, which is shutter priority mode. So we're going to start by switching the dial to S. The next thing that we need to do is make sure that your lens is again set to the smallest aperture setting. What's going to happen is that you're going to set the shutter speed in full stops. You can only set it to the exact to the shutter speed that is one of these numbers. And then your camera will determine what the best aperture is. Even if it's not a full stop, it will still use the best aperture. So I might use f5.9 instead of f5.6, for instance. Now, program mode and shutter priority mode, M250 and bulb mode don't work. They, they are non-functional in those modes. When you look through the camera, if you see FEE, -E, it means the same thing. It means that your lens is not stopped down to the smallest aperture. If you see F dash dash or hyphen hyphen, that means you have an AI modified Nikkor lens, which is one of the very old lenses that was modified by the factory or a teleconverter. Uh, the camera will still work, but it won't tell you what your aperture is going to be. When you look through this in shutter priority, it shows you the aperture that's going to be used in the LCD screen uh, instead of the shutter speed. Another thing that can happen is if you see the F hyphen hyphen in the LCD screen, that can mean that your camera has decided it's going to override your selected shutter speed. So even in shutter priority, if the camera says, hey dummy, that's not a good shutter speed, I'm gonna use something else, it can do that. The next mode is aperture priority. So we're gonna set this to A. Now aperture priority allows you to set the aperture on your lens, and then the camera selects the best shutter speed, and my understanding is that it will select any shutter speed, not just the full stops. So to use aperture priority, you wanna make sure that this is unlocked, and all you have to do is set the aperture to whatever setting you would like, and then take a picture. And if you have, have it wide open, the lens at the, at the lowest aperture number, the most light's going to go to the camera, so it's gonna take the fastest image. If we stop all the way down, you could hear that that was much slower, and even slower. So the amount of light coming through the camera, determined by both the scene and the aperture setting, allows the camera to determine what shutter speed it's going to use. Um, M250 and bulb mode do not work in this setting. And you can also set the aperture between click stops. So right now I'm at F4, click over to F5.6. If I set this, the aperture halfway between the two, which is about F4.5, let's call it, then the camera will know that it's between two click stops and adjust the meter reading accordingly. So even though this comes to rest at certain locations, click stops, 4, 5.6, and so forth. It's effectively a stepless aperture. All you have to do is 
set the, uh, the ring exactly where you want it. If you see a uh, high or low in the LCD during aperture priority mode, that's tell the, the camera is telling you that there is either too much high light or too little low light, and that the camera cannot make a proper exposure with a selected aperture. So mo let's say that you have a very fast speed film in here, like 3200, and you set this to f1.8 and it's bright sun you're gonna get a high light warning because the camera doesn't have a shutter speed fast enough to give you a proper exposure. The uh, Likewise, let's say you have F12, ISO 12 film in here and the aperture at F22 and it's, it's uh, 10 p.m. in the winter and it's dark outside. The camera's going to give you a low warning because it doesn't have a slow enough shutter speed beyond one second to give you a proper exposure for that combination. So the last mode that we're going to look at is manual, full manual mode. We're going to rotate the dial to M. Now you have complete control over your exposures. And what you're going to do is select your proper aperture and shutter speed combination. Now, as we saw looking through the viewfinder, there was the M plus and minus that displayed in full manual mode. If you see an M with a plus, you're going to overexpose. So you want to either give yourself a faster shutter speed or a smaller aperture opening. If you see an M minus, then you're underexposed and you either want to give yourself a slower shutter speed or a larger aperture opening. So minus means small number, small number. Plus means you need to have a larger number or a larger number. Full manual is the only mode in which M250 and bulb work. M250 is the only mechanical setting on the camera. And what that means is that, so M250, before you load your film, before you get to frame one, it's set to M250 automatically. It will always fire mechanically at 1 250th of a second, as long as you have a battery in the camera. Um, if your batteries die, you can still use M250 or bulb mode uh, as your mechanical settings, but they only work in full manual. M250 fires the, the, the shutter at 1 250th of a second. It also triggers the flash. Even without a battery, your flash will still fire with M250. And in bulb mode, it just opens up the shutter for as long as you hold down the button and then closes it when you release the button. So even without a battery, you can still do flash work or long exposure photography in this camera. It's not, so if, let's say worst case scenario that you get water in your camera and the electronics just die and your camera doesn't work except an M250 and bulb. You can still use it for flash photography um, or as a, a, a 1 250th of a second only camera or in bulb mode for things like overnight photography or darkroom flash work. So now that we've seen all of these various functions, let's go through this camera and the process of taking a photo. So first thing, we're gonna to go to pro program mode. We're gonna close this all the way. In program mode, the process of taking a photo is pretty simple. You set your ISO when you load the film, make sure that it's correct. Make sure you don't have exposure compensation on. Focus on, on the, your subject, take the picture. That's it, that is taking a picture in program mode. In shutter priority mode, you leave the aperture here in the smallest setting. You select the shutter speed that you want to use, focus on your, your subject, and take the picture. Just like that, pretty simple. In aperture priority mode, it doesn't matter where you have the shutter set during aperture priority mode, it's going to use the correct shutter speed regardless. I just set it to 250 because it's red and I would go crazy, really literally like crazy if the, the, the 250 wasn't lined up with the dot during aperture priority, oh my gosh. At any rate, so during aperture priority mode, regardless of where you have the shutter set, it's gonna take a picture with the shutter speed that is based on the aperture that you select. 
So all you need to do for aperture priority mode is select your aperture. Again, of course, make sure your ISO is set correctly. And then make sure looking through the viewfinder window that your shutter speed that the camera is going to use is one that you can hand hold it at. So if it says a 30th, a 15th, or anything slower than that, you either need to be on a tripod or you need to select a different aperture so that you can get an image that doesn't have camera shake. That's with a standard 50 millimeter lens. If you're using a 200 millimeter lens, you don't want to go slower than 1 250th. Anytime you hand hold a lens, you want to make sure that your shutter speed is equal to, or, or larger than the millimeter distance. So in this camera, let's say you had a 200 millimeter lens, you'd want to make sure that your shutter speed is a 250th, a 500th, a thousandth, a 2000th, or, or 4000th. And then once you have the aperture set, you just take the picture. Aperture priority mode for most people is the best mode to, to use because the aperture gives you the most control over how the camera functions. It also gives you the most creative control over how your image turns out. The shutter speed can be used to, to freeze motion or to blur motion, but the aperture controls your depth of field and the amount of light reaching. Uh, well, the shutter speed also controls the amount of light, but the, the aperture controls your depth of field. And uh, to my way of thinking, that's more important than than controlling how motion looks on the film because you will more often want to control your depth of field than stop motion for most people's photography. Then in full manual mode, you have control over everything and you just need to make sure that your shutter speed and aperture combination result in a plus and minus being illuminated over the M in the LCD window at the same time. So that's how you would take a picture. That's a process for taking a picture in each mode. And in a manual, just to finish it off, you just have to focus and then take your picture. And regardless of what your setting is, in manual mode, the camera will do what you tell it to do. That gives you the most creative control over your images. Now, a lot of people ask about how we do double exposures with cameras. So, Let's take a look at how to do a double exposure. I'm going to leave it in manual mode. That's just the, the easiest way to do this. I'll show you how to do a double exposure in various modes as well in the other modes. So let's say that I take a meter reading and it says that I need to use f5.6 and 1 250th of a second for my exposure. Well, if I'm going to do a double exposure, if I do both exposures at 1 250th, the final result is going to be overexposed to stop. So the first thing I need to do is set it to 1 500th of a second or change it to f8. Now, since I'm more concerned about depth of field, I tend to adjust the shutter speed. Two images at 1 500th of a second on the same frame equal one image at 1 250th. Likewise, two images at f8 with 1 250th on the same frame equal two images at f5.6 at 1 250th on the same frame. The same amount of light is being reaching the film because each time you move this dial, you either cut the amount of light in half or double the amount of light that reaches the film. Same thing with this, you either cut the amount of light that reaches the film in half or double the amount of light that reaches the film. So, I'm gonna set it to 1 500th take our first picture. Now we're going to hold this switch that way as we advance the film. And also you'll want to you'll want to hold the film rewind knob just to be certain that the film doesn't get taken out of alignment at all. And now you take your second picture. Now you've got your double exposure. You advance the film. You want to put your lens cap back on the camera. And the next thing that you want to do is take a dead frame. And the reason you take a dead frame is because after a double exposure, the registration doesn't line up perfectly. It takes a, a, a portion of the, of the frame advance for the film to, can, to start moving again like it should. So you take a dead frame to make sure that you don't have any overlap between the double exposure you just took and the next image that you're going to take. In aperture priority mode, the mechanics of taking a double exposure are slightly different. So you'll need to set your aperture to the 
selected aperture that you want to use. Let's say that you're again going to use f5.6 for, for your double exposure. Well, the camera is going to automatically select the, the setting which gives you the best exposure, the shutter speed that's going to give you the best exposure. So what you need to do is use the exposure compensation dial. So we're going to push the lock release down here and we're going to put it to minus one. Minus one is going to remove one full stop of light. So it has the same effect as forcing the camera to use the next slowest shutter speed. If you set it to minus two, it would be like forcing the camera to use two slower, uh, the shutter speed which is two slower. You would use minus two if you wanted to do a triple exposure, let's say. So you've got it to minus one. You've got it to the aperture you want to use. I'm going to take a little bit of slack out of the film. Hold this. Hit the shutter button. Push this button, this little lever here this way. Advance the film. Let it go back. Take our second image. And now finish advance. Well, you need to release. You need to let go of the film rewind knob before you actually advance after the second one. So pretend I did that last part correctly with releasing the re rewind knob there. Now afterwards, you want to go back to zero if you're not going to do another double exposure. And then the next thing you need to do is put your lens cap back on your camera and take a dead frame again so that you don't end up with any kind of registration overlap after the double exposure. Shutter exposure, shutter, bleh, shutter priority mode works the same way, basically. You want to set your aperture to f22 or 16, whatever your smallest aperture is, just like you have to do for shutter priority mode. Now you're going to select your shutter speed, say again, 1 2 50th, and let's say that you're, you're going to have an aperture of f5.6 again. Well, the camera is going to always select the best aperture no matter what, so you have to force it by going again to negative one to underexpose the image one stop and use f8. Hold this, hold the double exposure level down, lever down, advance the film, take your second shot. I just triple I just did a triple exposure there. Oops, same process for triple exposure, only with a triple exposure you'd need to go minus two or minus one and a half and then <clears throat> and then afterwards just make sure you set it back to zero and again you want to take a dead frame in program mode it works exactly the same way as what we've just seen where you set it to negative one and then go through the whole mechanics of taking a double exposure so you can take double exposures however you like uh, I tend to think of manual as being the easiest mode for a double exposure because it gives you the most creative control. You can, you can mimic that by using exposure compensation, but manual lets you achieve an effect more easily. So if you wanted to do, let's say, instead of a double exposure, a triple exposure where you took a, two pictures of the same scene and then put a person in that scene to make it look like they were a ghost or something like that, then you wanted to take a, a third exposure. It's easier to do that in manual mode than in the others. So for double exposure work, strongly recommend using manual. So there are some special features about this camera, one of which is that it has interchangeable focusing screens. Now you might be able to see that right where the tip of these scissors are, there's a little clip. And this is the point at which I would show you how to change the focusing screen, except that there's a mirror bumper seal covering that clip and this isn't my camera it's on loan so I don't want to cut this foam to get to the clip um, but to change the the focusing screen you just would release the clip there uh, holding the camera upright I'm just holding it like this to show you how it show you what it looks like but you'd hold the camera upright release the clip and then the frame and the screen would drop down you take the old screen out put the new one in and then put the clip back uh, put the frame back upright um, but because of the way that light seal was put on, uh, would have to be cut in order to do that. I don't. I couldn't find out exactly how many uh, focusing screens are available for this, but I would assume that it's the standard set of focusing screens for this, um, for the FE in that generation. But I don't. I don't know what number that is. So there's there's some number. All right. So that is it. That is my video series on the Nikon 
F-A. If you have any questions about this camera or photography in general, please let me know. And I'm more than happy to answer those and I try to do that fairly quickly. If this video was helpful, please leave me a thumbs up. That, let, that lets me know that I'm on the right track. If you have suggestions for future videos, um, please let me know. I'm more than happy to make those if I have the equipment and the technical know-how. And one last thing before we go, thank you guys for watching and take great photos.